Leto II is the one character in the original Dune series who can be seen as the ultimate Kwisatz Haderach, and even more. Leto II's first act as a newly born infant is to assist his blind father in killing the Tleilaxu face dancer Skytail by lending Paul his eyes. Both Leto II and his twin sister Ganema are preborn, fully aware and having the same other memory abilities as their Kwisatz Haderach father and the Bene Gesserit. They are born this way in part from the legacy of their father's genes but also as a result of the large doses of melange their mother Chani was forced to take in order to counter the effects of a contraceptive poison. The result of this greatly accelerates the birth process, causing the twins to be born prematurely. Leto II is named for Paul's father, while his sister is curiously named Ganema, which means a spoil of war in the Fremen language. At the end of Dune Messiah, the blind Paul wanders into the desert to die in the traditional manner, leaving the twins to be raised by the Fremen and his sister Alia, who acts as the regent of the imperial throne until their coming of age. Much of Children of Dune focuses on the growth and development of Leto II and Ganema as various plots begin to be aimed at them. With Paul Moadib Atreides gone from the throne, the various political factions begin to move against the children and Alia, their intent to regain control of the spice by whatever means necessary. In addition to this, when Sisia, one of Shaddam IV's daughters, seeks to return House Carino to imperial power by attempting to murder the Atreides twins and placing Faradin, her son, back upon the Golden Lion throne. Alia, who is falling to the onslaught of her other memory, seeks solace in the fact that the twins who are preborn may also be abominations. As she descends into madness, the malevolent personality of the Baron Harkonnen sows seeds of distrust in her mind and urges her towards harming the twins, who eventually flee from her control. As the plots resolve themselves, Leto II eventually meets his father in the desert, who has been alive all this time and masquerading as a mysterious blind preacher, often seen in Arakeen denouncing the religion of Moadib. They discuss the Golden Path, and we discover that Paul's prescient vision of the future in this light is fading as his son takes control of mankind's destiny and begins to set a chain of events into action. I'm here to give purpose to evolution and, therefore, to give purpose to our lives, Leto said. Do you wish to live those thousands of years, changing as you know you will change? Leto recognised that his father was not speaking about physical changes. Both of them knew the physical consequences. Leto would adapt and adapt. The skin which was not his own would adapt and adapt. The evolutionary thrust of each part would melt into the other and a single transformation would emerge. When metamorphosis came, if it came, a thinking creature of awesome dimensions would emerge upon the universe, and that universe would worship him. They do discuss the possible ways of proceeding down the golden path, Paul refusing to let his son have his body so that it may be enshrined and act as a cement for Leto II's vision. Leto II discusses the reasons behind the golden path with Paul, and attempts to see if his father will return to the course he abandoned. They talk of an event in the far future called Kralizek, the Typhoon Struggle. The term comes from ancient Fremen legends and is described as the battle at the end of the universe. Leto II accepts the responsibility of the Golden Path and begins a process of metamorphosis by consuming vast quantities of melange and then merging his own body with the sand trout of Arrakis. It was this sacrifice that Leto II was, unlike his father, able to take upon himself. By abandoning his humanity and taking on the mantle of the worm, both physically and metaphysically, in its mythological and religious interpretations as Shai Halud and Shai Tan, he is able to bring about a harsh rule that forces humanity into a crucible. Through his machinations, 
This will direct humanity's evolution to allow mankind to survive the events of Kralizek by forcing mankind down the Golden Path. Leto becomes the Emperor, calling himself Ari, the Lion of the Atreides. He is at once and the same time Kwisat Saderach, Preborn Abomination, and no longer human, as he is now in the early stages of his symbiotic metamorphosis. In conquering the multitude of personalities from his other memory, he has chosen one individual over all the others to keep the throng in check, that of Harum, without whom the distant future would not be. He persuades Faradin to remain at his court, with the false promise of betrothal and the offer of the position of imperial scribe and historian, giving him the name Hark al Ada, which means breaking of the habit. Faradin will be the male concubine of Ganema and produce her children, beginning the new breeding program under the god emperor's control. Leto II, however, announces that he will marry his own twin sister, although he is no longer capable of having children himself. The following extract between the newly established emperor and Faradin explains much of Leto II's new physiology and mentality, as well as providing excellent insight into his golden path. What must I understand? There's always a prevailing mystique in any civilization, Leto said. It builds itself as a barrier against change, and that always leaves future generations unprepared for the universe's treachery. All mystiques are the same in building these barriers. The religious mystique, the hero leader mystique, the messiah mystique, the mystique of science technology, and the mystique of nature itself. We live in an imperium which such a mystique has shaped, and now that imperium is falling apart, because most people don't distinguish between mystique and their universe. You see, the mystique is like demon possession. It tends to take over the consciousness, becoming all things to the observer. I recognise your grandmother's wisdom in these words, Faradin said. Well and good, cousin. She asked me if I were abomination. I answered in the negative. That was my first treachery. You see, Ganema escaped this, but I did not. I was forced to balance the inner lives under the pressure of excessive melange. I had to seek the active cooperation of those aroused lives within me. Doing this, I avoided the most malignant and chose a dominant helper thrust upon me by the inner awareness which was my father. I am not, in truth, my father or this helper. Then again, I am not the second Leto. Explain. You have an admirable directness, Leto said. I'm a community dominated by one who was ancient and surpassingly powerful. He fathered a dynasty which endured for three thousand of our years. His name was Harum, and, until his line trailed out in the congenital weaknesses and superstitions of a descendant, his subjects lived in a rhythmic sublimity. They moved unconsciously with the changes of the seasons. They bred individuals who tended to be short-lived, superstitious, and easily led by a god-king. Taken as a whole, they were a powerful people. Their survival as a species became habit. I don't like the sound of that, Faradin said. Nor do I, really, Leto said, but it's the universe I'll create. Why? It's a lesson I learned on June. We kept the presence of death a dominant spectre among the living here. By that presence, the dead changed the living. The people of such a society sink down into their bellies, but when the time comes for the opposite, when they arise, they are great and beautiful. That doesn't answer my question, Faradin protested. You don't trust me, cousin. Nor does your own grandmother. And with good reason, Leto said, but she acquiesces because she must. Bene Gesserits are pragmatists in the end. I share their view of our universe, you know. You wear the marks of that universe. You retain the habits of rule, cataloguing all around you in terms of their possible threat or value. I agreed to be your scribe. It amused you and flattered your real talent, which is that of historian. You've a definite genius for reading the present in terms of the past. You've anticipated me on several occasions. 
I don't like your veiled insinuations, Faradin said. Good. You come from infinite ambition to your present lowered estate. Didn't my grandmother warn you about infinity? It attracts us like a floodlight in the night, blinding us to the excesses it can inflict upon the finite. Benny Jezzer aphorisms, Faradin protested. But much more precise, Leto said. The Bene Gesserit believed they could predict the course of evolution, but they overlooked their own changes in the course of that evolution. They assumed they would stand still while their breeding plan evolved. I have no such reflexive blindness. Look carefully at me, Faradin, for I am no longer human. So your sister assures me, Faradin hesitated. Then, abomination? By the sisterhood's definition, perhaps. Harum is cruel and autocratic. I partake of his cruelty. Mark me well. I have the cruelty of the husbandman, and this human universe is my farm. Fremen once kept tame eagles as pets, but I'll keep a tame Faradin. Faradin's face darkened. Beware my claws, cousin. I well know my Sardaukar would fall in time before your Fremen, but we'd wound you sorely and there are jackals waiting to pick off the weak. I will use you well, that I promise, Leto said. He leaned forward. Did I not say I'm no longer human? Believe me, cousin, no children will spring from my loins, for I no longer have loins. And this forces my second treachery. Faradin waited in silence, seeing at last the direction of Leto's argument. I shall go against every Fremen precept, Leto said. They will accept because they can do nothing else. I kept you here under the lure of a betrothal, but there will be no betrothal of you and Ganema. My sister will marry me. But you... Marry, I said. Ganema must continue the Atreides line. There's also the matter of the Bene Gesserit breeding program, which is now my breeding program. I refuse, Faradin said. You refuse to father an Atreides dynasty? What dynasty? You'll occupy the throne for thousands of years. And mould your descendants in my image. It will be the most intensive, the most inclusive training program in all of history. We'll be an ecosystem in miniature. You see, whatever system animals choose to survive by, must be based on the pattern of interlocking communities, interdependence, working together in the common design which is the system. And this system will produce the most knowledgeable rulers ever seen. You put fancy words on a most distasteful. Who will survive Kralizek? Leto asked. I promise you, Kralizek will come. You're a madman. You will shatter the empire. Of course I will and I'm not a man, but I'll create a new consciousness in all men. I tell you now that below the desert of Dune there's a secret place with the greatest treasure of all time. I do not lie. When the last worm dies and the last melange is harvested upon our sands, these deep treasures will spring up throughout our universe. As the power of the spice monopoly fades and the hidden stockpiles make their mark, New powers will appear throughout our realm. It is time humans learned once more to live in their instincts. Leto II's symbiosis with the sand trout vectors makes him virtually impervious to physical damage. Soon after his taking of the throne, Leto II demonstrates his apparent immortality to the Fremen naibs, and in doing so secures his dominance over them and their allegiance having little real choice in the matter. At this point, physically at least, Leto II still bears resemblance to a human being, the main notable difference being his new skin. The next time we encounter him is in God Emperor of Dune, where we follow the events leading up to the end of his rule some 3,500 years later. Leto is barely recognisable as a human anymore only his face still bearing any similarity to the physical form he once had. The change has been immense, and most of his human attributes have succumbed to the physiology of a giant sandworm. Leto II's physiological change 
has also had a direct impact on the ecology of Arrakis. In sharing the sandworm's physical traits he also, unbeknownst to anyone and only recorded in his private journals, shares their weaknesses. He is unsusceptible to the damage that can be inflicted by just about any kind of weapon, and his control of the little remaining amounts of melange prevent any kind of planetary attack on Arrakis. He is however vulnerable to water, just as the sandworms are. At the beginning of God Emperor of Dune, apart from his arms and legs which are tiny and stunted, only his face remains seemingly human. His arms and legs are vulnerable to attack, and Leto II uses a cart made by the Ixians to move about freely. We learn as the latest incarnation of Duncan Idaho attempts to assassinate him with a las gun aimed at his face, that the appearance of what seems to be his one remaining major human trait is in fact far removed from his original human physiology. He muses upon this after killing Duncan that his brain was no longer directly associated with his face, it was not even a brain of human dimensions anymore, but had spread in nodal congeries throughout his body. In addition to these transformations, it is also important to note that the final physical and mental changes Leto II has undergone, as part of his own personal evolution from preborn to Kwisatz Sadarak and ultimately to God Emperor, are physically connected to his symbiosis with the sand trout vectors. His symbiosis is mentally linked to the control he maintains of other memory with the aid of the dominant personality of Harum. However, when threatened, the part of Leto II that comes from the worm takes over with frightening speed. This reaction is a violent subconscious defence mechanism that surprises even him, and he seemingly possesses no control over this. His major domo, Moneo Atreides, is always wary and on the lookout for signs that the worm has asserted control over Leto II, usually when he is angered greatly. The environmental transformation of Arrakis undertaken by the Fremen under the direction of late kinds was later continued by Paul Moadib and his sister Alia. Although this process was seen as a long term endeavour, by the time of the events in Children of Dune, some 20 years later, it is noted that this transformation is having a negative effect on the sandworm population and will one day affect spice production. As part of the change that he has undergone, Leto II has completely altered the ecology of Arrakis, with only a small section of desert remaining called the Sarir where he maintains his fortress. Leto II has carried on the ecological transformation to such a degree that the planet is no longer a hostile wasteland, but rather an Eden-like world. A mountain ridge has been moved and raised around the Sarir to limit its exposure to moisture from the seas beyond, and in its place is the Idaho River, the place of the God Emperor's demise. In addition to limiting the availability of desert on Arrakis, the roll on effect of this planetary alteration is to make the sandworms extinct, which in turn brings to an end spice production, which humans depend upon so heavily. The only remaining sand trout are the vectors that make up much of Leto II's sandworm like body. It is the God Emperor's intent upon his death which must take place in water to one day return Arrakis to the desert it once was. When he eventually falls into the Idaho River, it is these sand trout vectors in his body that will start absorbing all the water and begin the life cycle of the sandworms once again. They will seek out water wherever they find it, and begin the ecological transformation of Arrakis. The last evolutionary transformation of the god emperor occurs as he dies, with the multitude of sand trout vectors swarming into the waters of the Idaho River and beginning anew the changing of Arrakis back into a desert world. He explains to Hawaii Nori how this will happen, telling her that a little pearl of my awareness will go with every sandworm and every sand trout, knowing yet unable to move a single cell, aware in an endless dream. As the first drenching swept in from behind the sand trout overlappings, he stiffened and curled into a ball of agony, 
separate tribes of sand trout and sandworm produced a new meaning for the word pain. He felt that he was being ripped apart. Sand trout wanted to rush to the water and encapsulate it. Sandworm felt the drenching wash of death. Curls of blue smoke spurted from every place the rain touched him. The inner workings of his body began to manufacture the true spice essence. The death of the god emperor frees humanity from the oppression of his tyrannical rule and creates a power vacuum in the Imperium that results in the diaspora of the scattering, sending humanity out across the universe in diverse groups. His demise, deliberate, foreseen, and necessary for the golden path and the survival of humanity, is in his mind fourfold. It is the death of the flesh, the death of the soul, the death of the myth and the death of reason, and all of these deaths contain the seed of resurrection. Humanity will emerge stronger out of the God Emperor's rule, and his breeding program has produced Siona, an Atreides bred to be invisible from prescience, the terrible ability that evolution in the spice melange has created, and which has produced both the Jihad of Moadib and the all-powerful tyranny of the God Emperor. The result of the Bene Gesserit breeding program taken over by the God Emperor means that the offspring created by Siona as she mates with Duncan Idaho will produce individuals capable of one day helping humanity survive the ravages of Kralizek. One such descendant is Shiana, the wild desert girl who can control the worms having learned their language, a form of dance which creates a complex chaotic rhythm, and who is able to hide from those with prescient abilities.